All right, let us pray. Father, we thank you um, for this morning and every week when we gather um, that we might be strengthened and receive and that your Holy Spirit would be at work. Um, bless this time as we study your word, um, that it would not be um, merely head knowledge, but that we would move our hearts um, in fervent love toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so we got into Galatians 4. I, I want to just go ahead and start again at the beginning of Galatians 4. We'll, we'll read some of it again and then keep moving on. Um, in general, again, we've been talking about the law versus the gospel or the law versus the spirit. Um, and in many ways, you know, sort of Old Testament versus New Testament, but that's not always the best way to put it. Um, but really addressing misunderstanding about the law. Um, the law was never intended to save, but there's a temptation to make it into our Savior. And we like to do that because we can justify ourselves, in, and that's a lot more fun than relying on someone else in our minds. But it doesn't work. We can't rely on ourselves. We're not reliable. So, again, that's much of what this general theme is here in Galatians. So we'll jump in at chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, Chris, could I start back there with you, please? If you would read verses um, 1 through uh, 7, please. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Thank you. Yeah, so this is what we, we did read this last week. Um, but again, this idea that in Christ we are made brothers of Christ and therefore children of God. But we talked about this distinction that we're not just children, but we as the church are all sons. And, and, and by that we mean we are the heirs. You know, daughters would not have been heirs at that time. They would not have received inheritance. So specifically, we as the church want to be known as sons. I was thinking about this during the week, how um, we talked about... Well, in the verses even before that, you know, the list of there's no Jew nor Greek, um, slave nor free, male and female. Um, we talked about how just because we are in Christ, it does not get rid of the distinctions in the world. We still have men and women. We still have, um, you know, masters and slaves, or maybe better for us to think today, you know, you know, bosses and servants or bosses and employees. You know, in some way, there's a relationship, right? I mean, truly, right? Um, but in the church... Um, there's different imagery. So one of them is that we are all sons. So whether you're a man or a woman, you are made a son in Christ in the sense that you're an heir. But to give another example, another great theme is the bridegroom, right? So Jesus is the groom. The church is the bride. So whether you're a man or a woman, we collectively are the bride of Christ. And so that is sort of, it's wonderful how our earthly relationships um, reflect our, our collective relationship with Christ. And the, and the neat thing with this, too, is it reminds us that though we have individual faith, yet we are to be a part of the body of Christ. There's no such thing as being an individual Christian. You know, sometimes it may happen that you're isolated, but that's never really our goal or our purpose. We're always to be together as the body. Um, so again, we are all sons specifically, not just children, but sons. Um, because of Jesus. He has made us his brother, so we call God Father. And I think I brought that out last time, but how did disciples go to Jesus? How should we pray? The first words he mentions is our Father. He gives them this wonderful privilege to look at God, not just as the all creator, this thing to be terrified and fearful of, although in a sense we should, but in Christ we look to him as a Father. Let's just go ahead and keep reading. We did cover that last time. Let's, um, let's keep going. Um, but there is this distinction that before we were, um, like, basically like we were slaves, we were under a guardian. That's what the Old Testament was. It, it guided us. 
It kept us in bounds. The law, it doesn't save us, but it does help keep us away from more wickedness. It reminds us, it teaches us. But ultimately, we want to become children. We don't just want to be heir. We don't just want to be slaves. So he'll keep talking about that. So let's just jump into verse 8. Um, John, would you like to read? If you would actually just do 8 through 11, just that short bit. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God. And now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elements God meant to take those of the world? You slaves you were, you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Verse 9, I love that. <laughs> you have come to know God. Well, not really. You have been made, or how does he say that? Rather, you are known by God. Because we often want to talk about things... <clears throat> actively that we are doing something that's very natural but he says hold on no it's not so much that we know god but that god knows us yeah you know, what they do here is the <clears throat> right absolutely you cross the line so to speak by the word you said do you hear my word and believe him who sent me has eternal life right now mm -hmm. does not come into judgment for sin right but has passed out right. of death into life. Absolutely. And that is what is taking place here now. Yeah. As you said, we are now children of God, sons, adopted sons and daughters of God, which is it's so very wonderful. Yes. Uh, and, and so then what he's telling him, and in a neat way, he actually sort of compares the Jews with even with even Gentiles in a way. Because he says the Jews, even they sort of had a guardian. They had the one true God, and they could witness his grace and his salvation. But they're still waiting for the Christ in the same way that the Gentiles are. Because the Gentiles didn't have all of the Old Testament laws. They didn't have Leviticus. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. But what do we teach? That the law is on our hearts. We have a conscience, even if it's marred, even if it's uh, you know less than perfect. Um, you, like, you don't have to have the Ten Commandments to know you ought not murder. Right, So even Gentiles, in a sense, know what is wrong, but they can't do anything about it, right? And that's, and that's what we realize, whether you're a Christian, whether, you know, and that's kind of how we're different from the world. The world wants to teach positivity, that if we can just be better, you know, if we could just create a utopia, if we could just have the right government, if we could just stop wars, if we could just, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. Whereas Christians, we recognize, no, this is a sinful place. And as much as we ought to keep the law, we fail at it. And if we get caught up in trying to keep this one part of the law, we're probably turning a blind eye to this over here. And so that's what he's saying to them. Okay, Galatians, you Gentiles, you've come to know Christ, but you're going right back to what you knew before. Why are you going back to being a slave? You're children of God now. You're being like the prodigal son, leaving the father, um, going into the muck of the world. Come back. Repent. What does he call it? You turn back into the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world. And that's kind of wonderful. Um, you know, what are, we're mocked by the world, right? The world says we're fools. You know, science can disprove Christianity. You know, they, they would argue morals can disprove Christianity. You know, fill in the blank. How can you believe? We trust the one who made it all. You know, we don't put our, you know, we science is good. You know, ethics are good. But uh, we do not presume ourselves to know more than our God. And we trust him ultimately. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Well, really it looks like the enslavement that they're putting themselves under, they're putting themselves back under the law. Mm. And, right. You know, they're doing what the Jews do. They observe the feast of booze. Yeah, the right. The feast of Passover. You, you observe days, months, and seasons, and years, and you know that that doesn't sanctify, it doesn't justify, right. it doesn't make you right before God. Yeah, and so actually, maybe a better way to think about this, comparing Jews with Gentiles. So we've talked about the Old Testament saints did have grace; it wasn't just laws they were to follow. But in many ways, the Jews 
imitated the way of the world. So the world can only know the law. They can only know you need to be better. That's all they have. There's no grace and hope in the world, right? And that's what the Jews, the Pharisees especially, the Pharisaical tradition turned God's word into that as well. Rather than looking forward to the promise of redemption, they just simply took the commands that God gave them and turned it into laws. Well, the Gentiles have laws too. You know, the, the Gentiles want to justify themselves by who they are. You know, pretty much, in, 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 I, I don't like to say blanket statement, there's no other grace in other religions, but by and large, other religions, it's a question of morality. Have, does your good outweigh your bad? Have you redeemed yourself before God? That's pretty much how every other religion works in some way or another, and that is simply not how we are. And especially, so yeah, verse, so that was verse 10 you were referring to, right? The days and months, the, you know. And so again, it's not that them doing that itself was bad, but when they're putting their stock into that, right? Um, the church inevitably has to have traditions of some sort. We inevitably have to do things. We inevitably have to, um, we have to do things in good order. We're commanded to. Um, but there's always a temptation to think that these outward things are more important, Right? Um, so that's what Jesus com- uh, condemned the Pharisees, you know, teaching the, the uh, traditions of man as if they're the commandments of God, right? And so that's where the distinction is. You know, it's, I heard, how did one guy say it? To have no tradition is its own tradition. You know, we're creatures of routine. So you say you want to do a new thing. Well, you're still going to fall into a routine of some kind. You know, we are creatures of habit. Habit is good. It's, it's not that following months and seasons and years. But by the way he's mentioning it, it's clear that they think this of itself. You know, it's not just because you go to church on Sunday that you're saved, as if that outward action is what justifies you, right? Um, let's just keep reading. He'll tell us more. I don't need to talk about it. <laughs> uh Dave, would you like to read verse 12 through 20? Brothers, I entreat you to become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of the bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first, and though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God as Christ Jesus, what uh, what then has become of the blessing itself? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the language of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. I love that honest admission at the end. You know, he's frustrated. How are you doing this? And he hates the fact that he's even having to talk to them this way. I mean, I think parents could probably relate to that, right? I imagine. <laughs> um, so he mentions this, con- this bodily ailment. As far as I know, we don't know anything up to what it is, but, you know, apparently he needed some medical help of some kind that he was in their care and had to stay there. And, and then what happened? He built a relationship with them. God worked through that bodily ailment to connect them, right? And he commends them, you know. It was a trial to you, but you didn't cast me off. You didn't scorn me. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. And that word angel, I didn't look at this specifically, but angel in its basic form actually means messenger, so I don't, that's interesting. I don't know how to regard that. But I think his point is a messenger from God. It's not that often used about men. Usually it's used about an angel. But you can kind of get the idea of that. It's, it's kind of cool that words work that way. It makes you stop and say, well, what does he mean? You know, literally an angel with wings. Well, more so, it's not, angels aren't important because they have wings. They're important because they come from God with God's word. And that's what Paul is doing, right? 
Yeah, so that's a way to think about it, I suppose. But now he's saying, and he said, you would have gouged out your eyes for me. But now am I your enemy because I'm correcting you in the way of truth? You did all this for me, and now that I'm doing this good thing for you now, you know, there's contention with what I'm teaching. And that's what the world does, right? It turns us against the truth. Uh, So yeah, you can imagine the frustration. What does he say in 19? My little children in the faith, of whom I'm in in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. It's as if he's saying, gosh, it's like you were already born again in Christ, but now it's like you have to be born again. We have to deal with this pain and this suffering of you to be born again. Uh, you You can see it. It's very pastoral. You know, he could say, whatever, you guys do what you want. You know, I've got other churches. I mean, how many churches is he connected to? He's got no lack of people to go to, people to care for. He could just say, whatever, you guys go off and do your thing. He's utterly, you know, in anguish about their sake. Yeah. Um, he talks about they several times. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure that's the false teacher. Yes. Some in the Judaizers. Right. Trying to put them back under the restrictions of the law. Yeah. And uh, Paul, in, in the version I read, it says, they, they eagerly seek you, not, commend, not commendably that they uh, might shut you out, but it is good always to be eagerly sought, and not only uh, when I'm present with you. Mm. Paul, you know, by God's grace, his motives were pure. Yeah. Uh, like in Second Corinthians 11, he said, I uh, work to present you as a pure virgin mm. to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, and don't depart from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's, you know, he's putting forth the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not preaching himself. Mm-hmm. And the Judaizers are preaching. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And desiring that... that uh, Galatians seek them instead of Christ, which is a horrible thing. Yeah, and so that's an interesting question because I was wondering about that myself. You know, is it Judaizers coming in or is it possibly people even just twisting what the gospel is? Because that's inevitably what happens with heresy. You know, people take God's word and they twist it and they do make it. And that's kind of the mark a lot of times is it's about themselves. Um, So either way, right, it's you know, t- turning away from Christ towards the self. And he referred to the, in the self-help there as the agitators. Yeah. Hoping that they would follow them versus yes. the Christ. Yes. So it could be anybody else. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine it's ambition. It's, um, you know, zealots. Ze- you know, they're zealous about something and perhaps even with good intentions. But how's the expression go? The... <laughs> You said it, yeah. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> it is. It's so true. Well, it is. It's not just that we think these people are evil and have the most horrible ideas, but that doesn't justify going down that road. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I noticed that when he talked about Jesus, he doesn't say Jesus. He either calls him Christ Yeah. or... Christ Jesus. Yeah, often Christ or Jesus. Jesus Christ. Let me um what? So I mean so so again what is what does Christ mean in its basic form? The Messiah. The Messiah or the anointed one especially. Mm-hmm. Um so it's you know it's not his last name, right? It's right. a title. Um <laughs> uh, I was gonna pull up the Greek just to see because I can't remember if it's a word order thing that it's intentionally that way. But at that point, again, you almost can't read it as if it's his name. It's hard to actually train yourself to read it as a title. So it's kind of nice, like in Greek, it would say like the Jesus the Christ every time. There would be an article there, um, whereas we kind of shorthand it in that way. So I think that emphasis on his title, I think especially, well, for Gentiles, what are you trying to do? But teach them, you know, who Jesus is. And to know who Jesus is, you've got to know what came before you can, you can tell people Jesus died for your sins, but inevitably they're going to ask, okay, but who is he? You know, what, where does this come from, right? And so you need to emphasize this idea that he is the Christ. He has been appointed from the beginning. So that's, that's where that kind of comes from. I just, it's kind of interesting that he's not consistent. Right. It makes you wonder. Yeah. 
Um, is it intentional? Um, yeah, and I, I don't know. I think if you... Well, in this instance here, I think the angel of God and Christ Jesus are used as one because Christ is a messenger. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. And he's talking about how they thought he was a messenger or an angel of God. So he's kind of putting the is that, messenger, the message on the same level. Is that verse 14 you're thinking of, uh, Becky, right there? Yeah. What is yeah. it? Yes, 14. Um, you scorn and despise those who receive the angel of God as Christ Jesus. In general, you don't hear people in English say Christ Jesus unless they're quoting Paul. That's just not how we talk. He talks that way. It's translated that way often. I, I don't know if it would be, I don't know if you could think about it just similarly. Sometimes we just say Jesus. Sometimes we say Jesus Christ. Sometimes we just say Christ. And we say it as if it's his name, right, in a way. Again, but that's, I think that's part of it is it's a title. <laughs> Well, that could be too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah flexing yeah. muscles, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a. I, I don't know too much. I remember in a class we talked about it some, and it was kind of like, well, it seems like he uses it here. Um, yeah, yeah. I didn't read. I, I misread it the first time, but that's what you pointed out, Becky. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus, almost as if they received him as the Christ himself. Mm-hmm. Right, so as the Christ, not just as Jesus, because that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but as the Christ, as the Messiah. Good question, though. Absolutely. Let's just go ahead and um, keep going. Um, Matt, would you like to read? Um, if you would actually do 21 through, let's, let's read through the end of the chapter and we can break it down from there. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, carrying children for slavery. She is Hagar. And H- now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be no more. Then those of one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as the time, as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit from the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of a slave, but of the free woman. So there's a lot there. It's a really neat picture, but it's a it's a bit to kind of wade through this. So actually, it might be helpful if I sort of draw this on the board. So does everyone recall the story of Hagar and um, Sarah? Thank you. Does it mention her name in there? No, no, no. But we know. So even though the Bible doesn't say it, we can still call it that. He's so. assuming they know it. Yeah, exactly. So let's actually make a column. So. Between Hagar and Sarah, and what's the story with Sarah? She can't, she's barren, right? And so she finally, she's the one that presses Abram to uh, to uh, use the use Hagar to have a child. Um, so we have Hagar and Sagar, and he says, so one's born according to the flesh. And so again, what have we talked about? But um, the law is misused, or the law of the world is we have to cause things, we have to do things, and so that's what they did with Hagar. Hey, God's not giving us a child. You're supposed to be the father of many nations. We got to fix this. It's not working. You know, I mean, it's silly, but that's what it is, right? And how often we do that as Christians. It sounds silly, but we totally do this. We don't trust God, right? We are in our flesh. We don't trust God. We don't wait for him. We're not patient. He doesn't do things right in our mind. So that's where Hagar comes from, right? So then what does he say corresponds to each one? So let's say uh, promise versus flesh. 
And then, yeah, what did you just say, Becky? One was a slave. Yeah. And the other is free. You know, Jesus uses that language of slave, sl being slaves to the law, that we're bound to it. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, I was, this is really neat that Paul brings this out. The very enslavement that they're wanting to put themselves back under, Paul is saying, okay, you listen to the law, see what the law says. Yeah. And he brings in this allegory, and this is coming directly from the law. And this is where it kind of interesting again, um, the multiple usage of the word law, because so that's a kind of the idea. He's saying, look at the Torah, which contains law. But the thing is, the Torah doesn't just contain law. It contains promise. Sarah and Abraham, you know. Um, so absolutely, he's saying, OK, you want to play by your rules. You're not even being consistent. You don't actually know what it says. Yeah. OK, so what else do we have? So then it mentions Sinai. Right, so it's referring to Moses. So they're saying, "Hey, we only follow Moses," because in this way, he's char he's he's characterizing the present day Jews who are not acknowledging Jesus. So they want to only hold to Moses. They say, "Forget Jesus." So they're thinking Sinai, where you know, like the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments are given, right? And it doesn't give an alternative to Sinai, but I think we can fill it in. It doesn't mention Jerusalem. So it, well, and it meant, but it mentions Jerusalem twice, right? Yeah. So actually, what I want to do, so with Sinai, let's put Golgotha. Right? Is, does that sound fair? And then there's two Jerusalems. Okay, and we'll talk about that. So we'll say old. Present Jerusalem. Oh, present's good, actually. It says, yeah. It says present, yeah. And it's kind of interesting that it's still present even for us um, versus new. He mentions heaven. Covenant. Women are two covenants. Yes. Um, yeah, that's good. Let's talk about Jerusalem quick. Let's say present because we still have it and we still have a problem with this in the world, unfortunately. So, what does Jerusalem mean in Hebrew? Anyone know offhand? It means, go ahead. Well, there's a psalm that talks about Salem. Yes. And that means peace. Right. And so, yeah, Salem means peace. And, and, and Yeru essentially means city, city of peace. And so what does God establish Jerusalem to be but this great city on earth? But it's, it doesn't last as a great city of peace, but it's pointing forward. And so especially, uh, like the book of Revelation, will talk about the new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And then you get kind of this wacky thing with a lot of, I don't know, I'm not going to even talk about it much, but you have people that think we need to go get Jerusalem back. And that was even kind of the Crusades, right? Like, we need to go get the Holy City back. We need to get Jerusalem back. We don't need Jerusalem. They got sacked, and we could just walk away, you know? I mean, they still lived in Jerusalem for a while, the early Christians, and then they, I mean, they all had to move on. So, you know, present-day Jews even are concerned about Jerusalem. They don't even have a temple anymore. They can't do sacrifices, and this puts them in a pickle. Right? So they're still caught up in the present Jerusalem. We say we don't need it. You know, the curtain was torn. There's a Muslim. And there's a, there's a, I, very ironic. I mean, yeah, it's like almost like God's trying to tell us something in a way. We are looking forward to the new Jerusalem and eternal life, right? And even, you know, the caricature, we, we often say heaven, but we're actually looking forward to a new creation. So it's not just in heaven, but the new heavens and new earth where heaven and earth is united in this great city. So in a way, the old Jerusalem, it's not just a picture, it's a partial of it. Because what did you have? You had the temple where God was present. And so in a way, you did have heaven on, you had God on earth. You had heaven and earth united, but only in an imperfect way that didn't even last because of their unbelief. But we look forward to a final new one where it'll never be destroyed, never be corrupted again. All right, so present Jerusalem, new Jerusalem. And we talked about, yeah, where did it mention covenant? Oh, uh, that one. Uh, the, 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 um, yeah, one, two, three, four. There are two covenants, yeah. Um, and so that's, this one's a bit more challenging because it implies like, this is how people oftentimes will just kind of toss out the Old Testament because they'll say that's an old covenant. It is an old covenant, 
But what does Jesus do? He fulfills. He doesn't get rid of the Old Testament. He fulfills. The Testament and covenant are related words. And so what I would actually argue is this is a false covenant. So again, what did the Pharisees do? But they misinterpreted that. What did Paul say? Hey, you follow the law. You say you do, but you don't. You don't actually believe it. And so that's, we don't want to pit old versus new, but rather misunderstanding of old and really just a general misunderstanding by the world that we can redeem ourselves. We need a promise. You know, we can't, you know, the world is barren. God, God makes it, you know, bountiful. He makes us free. It happens on Golgotha towards the New Jerusalem. Was there any other? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say the covenants in the Old Testament, at least the, the salvation covenants, aren't really any different from exactly the, the fulfillment in Jesus. Yeah. It's all God saying, here's all the wonderful things I'm going to do for yep. you. Yep. Just Ex- trust me. Exactly. <laughs> and, and that's the whole point with the Old Testament versus New Testament is this is an Old Testament promise yeah. that we have to have or else the New Testament doesn't make sense. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah verse 24. Uh, now this may be interpreted allegorically. <laughs> These women are two covenants. Yeah. So that's kind of what you've been doing. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. And and allegorical, you know, that kind of means it's not just metaphorically. It is has more weight to it when we say something's allegorical. So much of the Old Testament's allegorical. Actually, a lot of it's pointing forward. Um, uh, actually, so not what we have quite here, but Abraham and Isaac, we would say that's an allegory of the father giving his son to die for our sins. So that's what allegorically means there. Uh, is there any other comparisons? Parallelism, that's a, it's a similar thing. Um, the only other thing I could see is... Um, he mentions the new, but the Jerusalem above, so that the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, she is our mother. So we talk about our father, we don't talk about our mother often, but it's as if this promise God gives, um, and we call it, sometimes you hear it called the mother church, and you know, for the for the Catholic church, they have a lot more they can talk about with that with Mary, but we can even, we can talk about Mary being a picture of the church, and being a mother of the church in many ways, without necessarily elevating her to the level of our Catholic brothers and sisters. But uh, so that picture of mother is even sort of there, even though obviously Ishmael was, did have a mother in Hagar. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say there's also, oh, go, no, that's fine. Go ahead. You started. Go, go, go. I was just going to say there was one more I saw the, uh, when it talked about the son of one being the persecutor, basically, and the other being persecuted. Yes. Lower, um, 28, oh, 29, sorry. 29. He was born, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. Yes. And so it is now also. Yes. Yeah. So just another parallel. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, and where you talked about mother, uh, Sarah was the mother of the promised child. Right. And Hagar was the mother of a child enslaved according to the flesh. Right, okay, that, that's good, yeah. So I'm just going to leave it there. But um, So even the idea that, you know, what was Hagar doing, in a sense she would be giving up this child. She'd be a surrogate mother, right? So it's just, everything here is just off tilt. It's off tilt. It's not quite, it's totally wrong, but it's you can see what it's trying to be, but it's off tilt, so... But on the other hand, she didn't exactly give up that child because she well, became kind of right. And, well, then you know, they had to send her, they had to send them both uh, yeah. off, right? Um, the problem, yeah. Right. So, um, and so the interesting thing is, it's not like we're saying Hagar's the devil because it's not even her fault, all her fault, right? It's what Abraham, you know, it's what they wanted to do. So in that way, it's not saying Sarah's the best and greatest. No, it's God working through her. Sarah wanted to work through Hagar. That's not the what they were supposed to do. So and it's not to say that Sarah was this great, wonderful person. And that might have been a custom of the day. It might have been that if they couldn't have Yeah, I mean, 
that you can imagine well, on the number of, of wives they could take and whatnot, and so yeah, uh, Tiffany, go ahead. But didn't Sarah treat Hagar really bad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She does. yeah. yeah and that's kind of my point is you know it's not that Sarah's an angel so, here. So Sarah was kind of like persecuting Hagar. Well, she yeah, was yeah, yeah. yeah it, it does kind of have that. And ran Hagar off. Right, and that's why. So that's why I didn't actually put the persecutor bit because that's almost it. Kind of goes back and forth because then. Well, and then what happens with Ishmael? Who, who, who roots themselves back to Ishmael? Islam. Yeah. yeah. Which we've had problems ever since then. Well, so interesting, right? Yeah. Yep, so. Um, about inherit, too. Well, cause, so yeah, so where was that at? Uh, 23. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit. Right. With the son of the free woman. So in a way, that summarizes all of this back to what we've talked about, that this... This, in a way, we'll say sums just at the bottom. This sums, sums sums it up that these are sons who will inherit versus slaves. They don't inherit; they have to earn, and they don't earn it, and they can't do anything to earn inheritance. A slave can't, you know. In, in the old world, there was no didn't matter how good of a slave you were, you couldn't make yourself an heir, right? Nothing you could do could, could um, possibly accomplish that. So. Um, didn't totally abandon Hagar. No. He came to her and said, There was some temporal blessing, also yeah. Also, be a great nation. Yeah. We can go ahead and wrap it up there. Do we have an announcement we want to make? or? Okay. Um, we'll wrap it up there. That's a great place to stop. Good stuff. Um, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all. This is wonderful. But you know,